Within this unit, I would like to talk about an approach to therapy that is very organic and seems to be a natural fit for most pastors. Because pastors deal with Bible stories on a daily basis and are trained in how to properly interpret these stories, narrative therapy seems to be a very intuitive process for them. Now, what is narrative therapy? Well, it is a process of change of the worlding process of the client, or in the interpretation of the meaningful stories of their life being reauthored in a new way. It is a process that can normally take place over around 11 or 12 sessions, and this means that it's a reasonably good fit for most pastoral counseling relationships. So, let's take some time and look at narrative therapy. When clients come into therapy, they will present a certain version of their story and pastoral counselors need to be aware of that because some stories will contain more liberating aspects of living than others will. More than that, one story will often be accorded a dominant position among the different stories and this dominant story will most likely be problem saturated. What we don't always appreciate is that our stories are necessarily a selection of our experiences. They cannot include all that we've undergone. They cannot be exhaustive. And herein lies the rub. If that is the case, what principles are being employed to prevent other types of experiences from being included within our story? And that is where the skill of interpretation of stories of the pastors comes in, to help the client explore their personal stories for both meaning and for change. Now, the first step in this process uh, and the first session of actual counseling after a session or two of assessment is the deconstruction of the problem-saturated narrative. The pastoral counselor listens carefully to the client's recital, knowing that the story is not the whole story, because experience is always richer than what can be expressed by language. And within this deconstruction process is the identification of the meta-narrative that sets overarching parameters on experience. Meaning that smaller stories that conflict with it will be banished from conscious thought. But these will inevitably exist within experience. So it's the role of the therapist to help the client to choose new parameters for the overarching story. However, this is a slow process. So this session is just about getting clarity over the overarching story, the meta-narrative. The next session will be about having the client come up with a name for the problem. Now that sounds simple, but a name implies power and authority over it. And the whole point of this session is to help the client see that they are not a victim of the problem and that they have some level of power over the problem, even if that's simply an attitude in the face of certain circumstances. And then comes the third step, the externalization of the problem. The pastoral counselor will help the client to see that the problem is not an essential part of them. It is something that can exist without and that they can exist without. In so doing, there is a recognition that the person is not the problem, that the problem is the problem, and that clarity becomes important. The fourth step, then, is to consider the social context of the problem. 
What are the social and political contexts of the problem? What are the beliefs that are part of this problem? What feeds the problem? What starves the problem? Who benefits from the problem? In what settings might the problematic behavior or attitude be useful? What sorts of people would definitely be opposed to the problem? Then in step five, there is the exploration of unique outcomes. If the problem-saturated narrative is the meta-narrative, then it sets parameters for most of experience interpretation. However, there will be times when the problem is not present and the meta-narrative is wrong. And it's important to highlight these exceptions. And this gives a place for their story to begin to have hope of life without the problem. Step six is then choosing to reauthor the story. This is when the client is invited to take a position regarding the problem. Now, the importance here is for the client to make the choice. This is not a place for the therapist to make the choice. And the client can choose to stay with the old story or to take fully into account the new elements. If the new elements path is chosen, then efforts will be made to establish an alternate narrative. And the client takes a position of author of their life. In either case, the client now owns the narrative and that can be therapeutic in and of itself. Now, step seven then is to thicken the plot of the story. And this is to discuss more details of this new alternate narrative, adding more characters and other perspectives to support the alternate story. Step eight then is to name this new counterplot. And this move gives this plot more definition and helps to organize the therapy more easily. When a, a particular event occurs, one can ask which plot was associated with that event. Was it on the side of the problem or on the side of the counterplot? Step nine then is to create therapeutic documents that memorialize the counterplot. This can take the form of session notes, letters, cards, questions, musings, reflections that the client has made, key phrases that characterize this new counterplot that, that the client is reauthoring. The goal here is to begin to consolidate this new counterplot and to strengthen it. Next is step 10, which is having the client bring in people to affirm the change within the client. The client will listen to and be validated by these people who affirm the client's new story. Finally then is step 11, which is reflecting teams, where others will come in and watch part of the session, and then the client will take some time to listen while these observers respond to what they saw, and reaffirm and validate the worth of the growth that is taking place. And this then leads to the closing out of the therapeutic relationship as the pastoral counselor and client take some time to celebrate all that has been accomplished. And the pastoral counselor encourages the client to continue on with taking the power to reauthor their life, to make good choices, and to strive to live in a positive, meaningful manner. One of the great privileges of being a pastoral counselor is that we have access to the wonderful depth of God's love and the foundation within the promises of God through the person and work of his son, uh, Jesus the Christ. One of the tasks that we have within the therapeutic process of pastoral counseling and pastoral psychotherapy is to help people to discover meaning in the midst of the suffering of life. This is important to give the person strength and re resiliency within life. Now, 
What do I mean by this? Well, it's all about hope. If the capacity to hope is an ontological given, a potentiality that exists from the infancy in every human being, then the possibility of its loss or corruption is also present from the very beginning. The conditions that make it possible to hope are strictly the same as those that make it possible to despair. Our hoping process is vulnerable to attack. And hopelessness is like an infection that invades a person's being and causes a sickness of the spirit. Despair is a serious spiritual disease with ramifications of every aspect of our existence. Now, I use the term despair because it is one of the intolerable conditions that people may find themselves in. Despair is a disturbance in the hoping process in which our capacity for hope is lost or blocked or distorted or in some manner impaired. It is suffering where meaning is absent. And so it's the purest form of suffering and despair is intolerable. Now, I want to be clear that despair and depression are very different. True, the symptomatology of depression and despair may be intermingled, but depression is an affect state that colors life. Despair is an overwhelming, all-consuming sense of hopelessness and helplessness. Now, what can contribute to despair? Well, the first thing is meaninglessness. The thing to remember about meaning within life is that it is not necessarily an objective answer. It is more complex than that. It is a narrative that we write with each moment of choices. And more than that, it is experienced not in philosophical reflection or introspection, but in engaging the world in specific ways. Most simply, meaning is experienced through the experience of some beauty or event or accomplishment. More complexly, it's experienced through the commitment to acts of love and service to something or someone. Something beyond yourself, a self-transcendence. And most complexly, through the attitudes that are chosen within the face of some suffering or unalterable circumstance. Now, in all cases, if meaning is present, the despair is banished. All that remains then is suffering, and suffering is very different from despair. Suffering can be carried. Suffering may even be chosen. To understand this, one has only to look at an athlete. An athlete subjects themselves to utter exhaustion, bruises, cuts, torn muscles and ligaments, and even broken bones, all for the sake of playing the game. The meaning is in the game. The suffering is chosen and endured as part of the sacrifice. And despair is not present. A few other things that can lead to despair are the loss of a future story. When a person loses something that they thought that would be a part of their future story, they will have a period of grief where they need to cogn cognitively reshift their perspective. They may need help in reframing life in a way that meets the new reality and a new story will need to be chosen and engaged in through living. Another cause of despair is when a goal is reached. When a story comes to an end, there is a place where there's that question, now what? In certain life situations, a person might experience what friends and family see as despair. For example, you have finally finished a major time and energy consuming project, such as graduating with an advanced degree or completing a writing project 
or being certified or accredited or passing professional board exams. Then, after a celebration, you find yourself despondent. Now what has happened there? The future story that has carried you along is now history. And you ask the question, what is left? Now, what is salient for the pastoral counselor is a recognition within this that finite hopes are not enough. That there will be times of despair when these moments come. There needs, therefore, to be a broader context for meaning. There needs to be a context for a super meaning, as Viktor Frankl would say, and that is where God comes into the picture. For God has a plan. We might not always see it or understand it. In fact, we never really see the fullness of this plan. But we can trust that it is good because God's character is one of love. As such, we have a context for a super meaning within which we can choose to experience the smaller meanings of human existence. And that means we can help our clients to see that there will be moments of transition within life, but the larger context of meaningfulness within life remains. And this allows us to continually reinvest ourselves into future stories. So the task for the pastoral counselor is to ask questions to explore the super meaning of life, to ask questions, to help the client to think about the meaning to be discovered even in the suffering moments of life, to encourage the client to choose to engage in some way in a loving action, a creative act, an experience, or even in choosing an attitude. For any one of these activities will banish despair. When despair is banished, what is left is meaning and suffering. And even in the face of this, hope can be found in the steadfast love of God.